Hello, and welcome to the book top for Tamara Winfrey Harris and her latest book, Dear Black Girls, Letters from Your Sisters on Stepping into Your Power. Uh, I am so honored and happy uh, to be able to introduce uh, my friend Tammy and my colleague. Uh, this is her second book. Uh, she has been doing some amazing work and uh, I'm so excited uh, that you all are gonna get an opportunity today to learn more about uh, the latest book. Uh, as we know, everyone needs support, everyone needs guidance and mentors. And I, my sincere hope is that this book will get into the hands of many, many young black women uh, so that they can truly step into their power. We are also gonna have Dr. Tiffany Dent and Dr. Carolyn Strong uh, on our panel today. And so without any further ado, and actually I didn't even introduce myself. Uh, my name is Michelle M. Hayes and I'm the founding leader for the Center for Black Literature and Culture, which is part of the Indianapolis Public Library at Central Branch. And so I am now going to hand it over to Tamara Winfrey Harris. Thank you so much, Nichelle. And I am so excited to be here with my friends, Dr. Tiffany Monfordet and Dr. Carolyn Strong. You know, we get together every other week. We have a video cast called Centering Sisters. So I feel like we should just do like we do and we have to go through the introduction part. And Carolyn always introduces herself first. So who are you, Carolyn? I have no idea today. <laughs> um, <laughs> I am Dr. Carolyn Strong. I'm an educator in the Chicagoland area. My research focuses on the discipline disparities in schools as they relate specifically to African American girls and bridging those discipline gaps. I also work toward establishing anti racist cultures in schools so that we can change school cultures and norms and, you know, stop being racist in school. Hey, Dr. Dent. Hey, my name is Dr. Tiffany Monfort Dent. I am a licensed psychologist. I call myself a psychologist for the culture because in my work, I center the needs of Black people. Um, I do research and trainings on issues of culturally informed treatment, um, the impact of racial trauma and racial stress on Black clients, and the need to make sure that in the work that we do, we recognize how systems play into the mental health of Black folks. And so so I am excited for us to have an intro from our author, um, the Tamara Winfrey Harris. And I am Tamara Winfrey Harris, and I am a, a writer who specializes in race and gender and their intersection with politics, pop culture, and current events. My work has appeared in the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Los Angeles Times, Ebony, Miz, and other outlets. My first book was published in 2015, The Sisters Are All Right, Changing the Broken Narrative of Black Women in America. My second book is Dear Black Girls, Letters from Your Sisters on Stepping into Your Power. And the other thing we do every other week on our video cast is Tiffany is always in charge. So <laughs> Tiffany just told me to read my preface, so that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> The preface is, we are all right. And it starts, my black girls, you tell me things. You tell me how you love your mamas, but kind of hate them too. You tell me about, ugh, fuck boys at school who text dirty messages. You tell me about beauty insecurities, two big noses and five heads. You tell me who you like showing me pictures of boys on IG and giggling, ain't he cute? You tell me these things and I smile. It has been a while since I was a girl, but I remember hating my parents' rules and being insecure about my looks. I remember the trifling boys and the super fine crushes. Some things about black girlhood never change. You tell me other things too. Tell me about anxiety or depression that will not let go. You tell me about social media memes that leave you feeling demeaned and hated. 
You tell me about boys and men who violate you and families who cannot deal with the devastation of sexual assault. You tell me about carrying the burden of friends and family who have been murdered. You tell me about families who cannot accept your queer identity. You tell me about schools that suspend you for petty reasons. You tell me how people assume you are angry, unfeminine, grown, and hypersexual before you can even find out who you are for yourself. You tell me these things and I worry. I remember that the world does not value black girls like it should. And some things that are too common in black girlhood must change. Yes. I, I think one of the things is that I know in the work that you do, we know that you center the needs and the voices of black girls and women. In your first book, The Sisters Are All Right, you made a space for us. And in this book, you are talking to and with black girls, which is a distinction, mm -hmm. talking to, but with at the same mm -hmm. time. And, and I guess the first thing I wanted to know about Dear Black Girl um, is what made you come up with this particular book is different from The Sisters Are All Right. Um, definitely again for, you know, black women and girls, but how did you even come up with the idea for Dear Black Girl? So you, you all know <laughs> that being in the company of black women always, like all kinds of inspiration always comes out of it. Yeah. So it was actually a workshop I was doing with two dear friends named Talk Dr. Tiffany Monfordin and Dr. Carolyn Strong here in Indianapolis for the Keffer Institute. It was a couple years ago. Um, it was an intergenerational workshop and the idea, you know, I just got this offhand idea that maybe it would be nice if the girls who were participating left with a letter from a black woman. And I went to Facebook and kind of offhandedly asked if people would be willing to write letters. And that call went viral and black women showed up and showed out and I ended up getting more than 50 letters um, from all over the world written to black girls. And they were amazed, like the first one I read um, made me ugly cry. And you know, I hate to do that. Um, yeah. And I realized, you know, these were letters that needed to be in multiple girls' hands. And I thought one good way to do that would be to make it into a book. And, and I, the interesting thing for me is how you titled it. Because sometimes um, we know that society, when it writes something about girlhood, that there's this expectation that we need to find ourselves in it. We need to find those pieces that may relate to us, but it really doesn't fully tell our story. And you titled this one very clearly, Dear Black Girl. Like you put it out there. Why was that so important to put on the title, Dear Black Girl? And I'm wondering from you and then of course, Dr. Strong, what difference that might make for Black girls who are seeing this book? So I write for us. I write for Black women and Black girls. There are so few places where we are centered. You know, very often when we talk about race, we talk about Black men and boys. When we talk about womanhood and girlhood, we talk about white women. I center us in my writing, which doesn't mean that other people cannot learn, read it, enjoy it, gain from it but I write for us and I wanted that to be clear. I wanted black girls to be clear that this, this is something that was done for them. This love and regard, these messages from black women are explicitly for them. And I know Dr. Strong, you work in schools. And yes. I know one of the things you're always talking about is representation matters. What does it mean, do you think for black girls and specifically as an educator, when they see a title that says, dear black girl, like this is you. How is that different for them? I mean, it's different simply because it exists. Um, the default is to the dominant culture. So if the title were to be dear girl, then we already know who the presumptive audience is. Um, and the fact that it says girl because we are adultified so quickly and so early that 
if it does say girl, then we already know we're not talking about black girls because by the age of six, you should be able to prepare dinner for four um, and do all of these things before your milk teeth fall out because that's just the expectation. Mm -hmm. And you all know that the Georgetown study fully supports that. So, right. fully, uh, excuse me, fully supports that notion that this is how black girls are seen. So just even in saying dear black girl, when we know that these are young women um, and typically with black girls, that's how we want to categorize them. By the time they're eight or nine, we're like, okay, so you're a one woman now. No, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're still a little girl and you're still a girl. And we need to treat you as such and we need to allow you to be that way because adulting is hard enough when you're an adult but then when you push somebody forward into that you get a whole bunch of additional issues because they just weren't mentally prepared to be there mm -hmm. so for me this is this is very layered in the sense that the girls in schools don't think of themselves as being worthy of much um, I work in the discipline office and something as simple as asking them what happened often takes them aback because they're so used to nobody caring about their version of events. Um, it really does just become a matter of, okay, I'm here, just give me my punishment. And I'm like, I asked you what happened. And then they're like, well, it's not going to really matter to you anyway, because that's just what they're used to. So, so I guess I'm wondering, um, so what I'm hearing is a couple things that one, usually if this would have just been called dear girl, mm -hmm. that black girls wouldn't have felt it was for them because when we think of girlhood, it's not us. Yes. Um, yeah. And anytime we're talking about gender-based things, it's the default is white girls. And then yes. also the, the push for black girls to not even be able to embrace girlhood because they're pushed into womanhood. Mm -hmm. And that even though this book may have pieces that other people can find, which is what the expectation is for Black girls usually is find yourself yes. in these different places, um, but nothing is for you, that this was specifically for Black girls. It doesn't mean other people can't find anything, but this is that love letter to them. And so I kind of want to ask, when you were putting this together, um, what are the areas in this book? Um, what are the topic areas? Uh, and why were those selected in terms of dealing with Black girls and communing with them? So, you know, there were two things. One, I wanted Black girls to see themselves in this book in all the ways that they show up in the world. So this, I didn't want this book to be about how we wish <laughs> Black girls would show up in the world or the ways we want them to show up in the world so that they are pleasing to whiteness or so they are respectable. I wanted this to reflect all the ways they show up in the world. And I wanted it to speak to some experiences that black girls have, good and bad, but particularly some of the ones that we know that black girls deal with that we don't talk about, even though we know there's a disparity in black girls experience them more than other people. So for instance, we know um, that 60% of Black girls will experience sexual assault before they are 18. We don't talk about that a lot, which contributes to a feeling of shame. So it was important to me to have women, Black women in the book who had survived sexual assault talk about that experience. Um, but it was also important for me, for girls to hear from biracial Black women and Black women who um, were adopted and Black women who were raised by their grandparents and Black women who were business women um, and uh, Black women like Carolyn who were learning to love um, their brown skin. Like all of the queer Black women, you know, trans Black women, you know, I wanted all of those experiences to show up so that, that I didn't want black girls to pick up the book and feel like eh, this was for every black girl but me. And I'm sure I left out some experiences because we are so like, we are multitudes, um, but it was important for me to get in as, as many experiences as I could. Are you saying that black people are not in fact a monolith? Is that what you I know? Mean? It's crazy. 
but I am. <laughs> oh, wow. And, and I guess I'm, I'm wondering about the need for that, that, in, that hearing what is so important about hearing these experiences from other, from former black girls, from these now black women, why is it important for black girls to hear it from them? Because again, society in a moment will tell you, yes, we know these, there other people will tell them these statistics and we know that this is hard for you. And we, under, we understand there's colorism, but why is it so important for those firsthand experiences, which is what Dear Black Girl is, is that black women are like, telling their own experiences and saying, this is what it was like for me and this is what I want for you um, instead or how you can learn from my experiences or what you deserve. Why is it so important that these firsthand accounts um, from black women, why is that the need in this book? I think, in it, and then I would love for Carolyn to mm -hmm. read her letter because I think it's mm -hmm. a good example of this is that, you know, it's one of the things I say in the book is you know, I am you, you are me, and we are all right. Mm -hmm. You know, Black women and Black girls, you know, no one knows a Black girl's experience like a Black woman does. And I think sometimes we miss the opportunity to be vulnerable. Very often, you know, we approach girls like this because we are scared for them. We know Black girls don't get a lot of chances. We know they don't get a lot of grace. We know they're judged harshly. And we want them to be okay in this society that really wants them to be anything but. And so we're all about telling them what they should do and what they ought to do and what they you know, don't do. Um, instead of saying, here was my path and here was my experience. And I was very lucky to get an endorsement from Tarana Burke on this book. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking recently about her story. You know, she talks about how the Me Too movement came to be. And she said, 13 year old black girl was talking to her and talking about her experience with sexual assault. And afterwards, you know, Tarana wondered why she didn't say to that girl, me too. And I think we miss the opportunity to say me too to black girls a lot in a lot of areas. Um, and so, you know, it was very important to me in this book that black women, and that's one of the things I asked for in the letters that we be vulnerable and open and share our experiences because I think it creates a kinship and a sisterhood that we miss sometimes. And in that, um, definitely I would like to, um, for Dr. Strong to read her letter now, um, which the topic was, Dr. Strong, do you wanna tell us what your topic was? I know, colorism. but I just want. Colorism <laughs> and just um, growing up in as a dark skinned girl and just kind of writing, trying to write something that would have been helpful to me um, but before I do that, I do just kind of want to address what you were saying before regarding the whole notion of fingers of derision, <laughs> because that's one of the things that I often even tell the adults in my building. I'm like, you guys have to move from like the fingers of accusation and the fingers of derision and start utilizing hands of help because we know what you're trying to do. You're just not going about it the right way. So yeah, that's it. And I shall read my letter now. Dear brown skinned black girl, if no one else tells you this today, hear it from me. You and your dark chocolate shell are beautifully and wonderfully made. As a young girl growing up with chocolate skin and 4C hair, the tightest of tight kinks and curls, I didn't see anyone on television that looked like me. And if somehow a girl like me did make it to the screen, she was usually being made fun of. That made me feel like I was not beautiful. And I've spent the last 35 years trying to turn that feeling around. I'm going to do my best right now to tell you the things that I wish someone had told me back then. Read this as often as you need to, to be okay. They hate you because they ain't you. Look around, love. People who don't have what you have and don't look how you look are paying big bucks to get what the cre creator bestowed upon you for free. The next time you see a girl on IG tanned to death with lip fillers, butt implants, and box braids, just remember, yours is free and organic. 
you are slowly, ever so slowly, moving toward a world that sees the beauty in you, in us. As I write this, Miss Universe, Miss America, Miss USA, and Miss Teen USA are all beautiful, vibrant Black women. Black women of varying hues and hair textures. They are a visual representation of all the ways Black girls can be and are physically beautiful. In the meantime, know that the absence of dark-skinned girls in mainstream culture says more about the people making the culture than it says about you. As a girl, I remember thinking, what's wrong with me? I had a ton of answers and each one made me feel worse than the one before it. I don't want that for you. Bump that. You're melanin. The thing that controls how brown you are is an asset. People will give you crap about it and they may, and you may not appreciate it now, but know this, honey, the saying black don't crack is real and melanin is the best anti-Asian cream you could ever ask for. Beautiful black girl, if you let it, this world will take your soul and try to convince you that you handed it over willingly. It is my job as a fellow black girl to stop that from happening. I start by telling you, you are beautiful. The creator makes no mistakes but also know that in your beauty lies the ability to do and be anything you want. And if nothing else, know that this chocolate girl loves you. That I, I've heard it before, as you know, but every time I hear it, I sit and I just, I just have to process um, because there's so much richness in your letter, um, specifically as a mother of a darker skinned girl, like I'm like, I need you to, <laughs> because even if she doesn't say those things to me, you you know that these are those experiences and to be able to see those on paper and have someone actually acknowledge it and mm -hmm. what that means for them. And I'm wondering, Tammy, because in reading Carolyn's letter, I know she said that part of it was, this was her experience and what she wanted other black, um, darker skinned black girls to understand and to maybe some of those hurdles that no one was explaining to them um, that they were gonna experience and challenging them. This is, I've been there. This is how we need to look at this and I'm supporting you in that understanding. The writers of these letters, because you asked them to be vulnerable. I'm wondering what some of them have said about that process of putting onto paper what they needed. Um, so the next generation of black girls don't have some of the negative experiences that they did. You know, a lot of letter writers have said the process of writing the letter was cathartic in itself. And I mean, you guys can speak to that as letter writers that, you know, it required them to access a vulnerable place in themselves um, that they don't access a lot. Um, and go back to think about, you know, you know, hurts that might still be there with the, the little girl that lives inside of them that they hadn't addressed. And I just, you know, as, as Carolyn was reading, it struck me how different, how different what she wrote is from not just the fingers of derision, but also the other thing that we do, which is the, it's no big deal. Like, girl, you know, you, you know, you cute. You know, look, look at your chocolate brown skin. You know, you, you know, it's where we, you know, skip over some of the hurts and things that girls feel and, and, and encourage them to just move on and not process it. And I think a lot of adult black women have experienced one or the other, the derision or the girl, you, you go on. Or the is derision or dismissal. It's usually, it's usually one or the other. Somebody ought to give you a doctorate or something. Something. I'm just saying. <laughs> you should write some books, Dr. Strong, or something. <laughs> develop some curricula. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, derision or dismissal. And so, you know, the, the act of writing these letters helped them to process that. And my original letter was a lot longer. Um, but then again, the educator in me said, you need to pull it back because you want them to actually read the whole thing mm -hmm. because we're talking about kids. So like the original, and I was like, if we do this again, then there'll be more to expand upon because one of the things that was in the original letter was just um, how as a dark skinned woman, you're automatically, or dark skinned girl, you're automatically viewed as more aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the color gradation that is congruent with perceived aggression 
and how you need to understand that these people's perception of you is just that and it doesn't have to be who you are. I mean, there are goo gobs of studies even um, intraracially that talk about suspension rates and colorism and how light-skinned kids are often given the benefit of the doubt where dark-skinned kids are are suspended um, without without any type of benefit of the doubt. So I talked about that and I was like, mm, maybe later uh, because there was no quick and succinct way for me to break that down for them. Like you could say, like, just understand and know this and and process it the best way you can. Whatever you say is automatically going to be seen as an attack because of your shell. And, and, I, and I guess I'm wondering about that too, because I know Carolyn, you're saying there was so much more that you could have put in this letter that you did. And then you kind of said, let me chop it down. And I guess I'm wondering for Tammy, once the book was done, again, dear black girl, <laughs> letters from your sister on stepping into your path. Once, <laughs> you once mean this book, one? <laughs> I mean, this one. Oh, okay. Yes, this one. Oh, wait, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. <laughs> so I guess I'm wondering, um, when you kind of looked at the book and I know Carolyn was like, there's other things that I wanted to just even put in my letter. And we know that we're not monolith. Was there something that you're like, oh, this piece, I don't see it enough. Or I feel that it's not that if I had to go back, I would want more in this area. Is there anything in Dear Black Girl that you feel is not as much of as you wanted? or that you feel is absent that's important? So two things I can think of. And one is um, that I didn't get a letter from a black woman who deals with disability, physical disability. Um, and so I wish I had, I had included that. And one, the, uh, the second thing is the sex chapter. You know how hard it was to get black women to write about, write to black girls about sex. Now it, it turned out that the letter that is in that chapter is amazing. Toya Smith touched on all of the areas that are important from consent to safety, to pleasure, to like all, you know, mechanic, it was like biology, all of those things. But what I had hoped you know, I envisioned a chapter with like four or five letters with, you know, different women um, digging into those issues. And I think that's an important, it's given the way that black girls are sexualized um, and giving the really confusing environment that black girls exist in where, you know, there's an element of hypersexualization that is very um, um, lauded now but black girls and black women still have to deal with this Jezebel image where you know the, the lines for us are very blurred and very thin. I would have liked to have found more black women to talk about um, that topic. I, I think one of the things I noticed though is pretty much every topic in here is one that black women and girls are not allowed to talk about for mm -hmm. the reasons that Carolyn said, that they're either dismissed or um, we deride them for even caring. Like there are these, these pieces. And I think even from the fact that we talk about fully having these conversations about what it's like um, to struggle with friendships, um, mm -hmm. what it's like to struggle with sexual orientation and identity, um, what it's like to not have the relationship with the caregiver that you want, what it's like to not have the traditional family that other people have, those conversations that are truly a daily part of the lives of black girls, you were able to somehow get black women to talk about stuff we don't talk about. I agree with the sex chapter. And I think that that's still that area um, that yeah. we don't, we are still struggling to process you as well. You know what other area, this is how you turn the tables on Dr. Tiffany Monford did. Um, mental health. Exactly. That, that's another area where, so I met Tiffany because I was working on a book and still am working on a book about how we can nurture 
radically raise Black girls to be okay despite sexism and uh, racism. And someone said, when I started talking about mental health, you have to talk to Dr. Tiffany Dent. And I did, and she was absolutely brilliant in the ways that you know she talked about Black girls and the fact that we don't pay enough attention to Black girls' mental health, which is why I thought it was important to lift up that chapter and to have Dr. Tiffany Dent contribute to it. So perhaps- What Dr. you write, girl? What you write? You didn't realize that Dr. Tiffany was trying to avoid or anything? Talk, you might talk about what you wrote, why you wrote it, and even, perchance, read dun, it. Dun, dun. <laughs> And that was the thing. I was trying to get like smooth on that. Oh, girl, <laughs> I, bye. Read the letter. I know your tricks. <laughs> I, right. Um, so um, my letter was actually pretty short um, because I just wanted to focus on a couple of areas. Um, as a psychologist, uh, one of the things that I realized is that we don't allow space for Black girls to process what it's the stress of black girlhood, of being black and girl. And then if we add in there not um, being trans or we add in there um, being gay, whatever other components that happen that we don't allow space for those intersections and what the stress looks like. Um, we often frame it and name it something else when it manifests itself. Um, and so just wanting for black girls to know their mental health matters, um, what they experience actually is happening um, it's not this girl, like Carolyn was saying earlier, Dr. Strong was saying, dismissing it like whatever, you strong, handle your business, but saying that this is real and it needs to be addressed. So um, my letter was shorter um, because I just specifically wanted to focus on those areas. So I'm going to take my glasses off. This is how, you know, struggle, the struggle in the street. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Dear Black girl, you are facing a world that does not always value you, a world that expects you to be strong, a world that wants you to embrace your girlhood and innocence, but also take on adult responsibilities. People may expect you to just handle it if someone tries to steal your black girl joy or uses your developing curves as a justification for assault. The crushing pressure, anger, and frustration that can be a part of black girlhood can feel overwhelming. Black girl, you are allowed to feel overwhelmed and to expect that there will be others who will take away some of the burden. You are permitted to feel sad, frustrated, anxious, and to have those feelings acknowledged. If you hear that there's no space for your expression of feelings, no resources to provide you support, or that black girls don't struggle, do not believe this. Your emotional wellness matters because you matter. Your feelings, they are real. Your trauma over things that have happened to you is real. Your worry about encountering racism or other poor treatment is real. Your anxiety or depression are real, even if you cannot quite figure what causes them. Your anger that others call attitude is real. Your hopelessness when it feels your community does not value or see you or that it values black boys over you is real. The first step in making your emotional health important is making it okay to say that you experience all these things. They are real. The unfairness in our society, especially the sexism and racism directed at black girls can cause and reinforce fear, loneliness, and self-doubt. I work with lots of girls like you and I know that what some folks call attitude or being difficult is your expression of how hard it is to be you, black and girl, in spaces that do not seem to care about either identity. Black girl, you do not have to be strong all the time. You do have to care about yourself all the time. As you grow and become a woman, find spaces and people who will help you navigate your journey in all its beauty, awkwardness, and pain. Demand spaces where you can be vulnerable and expressed without fear of getting in trouble or being ignored, your worries, your hopes, and your doubts. You do not, should not have to figure this out alone. There is no shame in seeing a therapist if you need to. We go to doctors to keep our bodies healthy. We can go to doctors to keep our minds healthy too. 
It is also important to have Black girl spaces where you can be honest and real with people who understand your experience best. Do not let anyone, even Black women, tell you that your problems are not important, that you should be stronger. Sadly, many of us received these bad messages when we were girls. We still receive them. We are just repeating what we know. When you have people who support you without judgment, when you have circles of support of Black girls and women, when you have therapy to heal your mind, hopefully you will come to know that you deserve joy. Not simple happiness, but joy. Joy is having access to people, places, and activities that speak to your soul, soothe your spirit, bring you hope, and make your heart soar. It is not enough for Black girls like us to just know about our pain or to speak on it. We must also allow ourselves the time and resources to move toward good emotional health. We have to have space to heal. People may not offer us the space willingly, but Black girl, know you are worthy of it. As you move into womanhood, take your space. Go in joy. I say this every time, but I promise you there's like five t-shirts in there. <laughs> like take your space go enjoy like i i could i could go on but people keep saying i have a hoodie addiction so i won't <laughs> <laughs> you just made a light bulb go off in my head so i i guess I was. i'm real good at that <laughs> <laughs> and i know that we say that this book is for black girls um mm -hmm. When you're, when you're thinking in your mind, both of you, because I know Carolyn, you're an educator, so you have this, you know, developmental level stuff going on. And t the Tamara Winfrey Harris, you are the author. Um, what age group do you, what did you, did you think about when you were looking at this book? Like if I'm sitting here and saying, I want to give Dear Black Girl to mm -hmm. Black girls because every Black girl deserves this book. Um, what Black, what do you look think of? What ages do you start at when you're thinking this book is for them? I think the sweet spot and, and what I told letter writers is between 15 and say 21. So high school age to college age. I think it's possible, you know, for younger girls to understand the book, especially if they read it along with um, their mom or another caregiver or an aunt. And as a matter of fact, there is... Um, if you visit my website, TamaraWinfreyHarris.com, there's a free downloadable uh, reader experience guide that offers some additional questions um, that can help Black women process the book with Black girls, as well as a handy dandy guide. I consulted an educator and a psychologist, Dr. Carolyn Strong and Dr. Tiffany Dent, for <laughs> some advice on uh, how to have good intergenerational conversation about some of the topics in this book. What, what would you say the same age? Dr. Strong is at 15 to 21. I have some different thoughts, but. Oh, um, I think that honestly, some of you could go probably down to middle school, honestly, um, because they're dealing with some of these issues. Well, they're dealing with all of these issues, um, just not necessarily on, on such an egregious level, but that's when the stuff starts. Mm -hmm. I would even argue that it starts a bit younger, but for sure, by middle school, you are having to deal with just about everything that we're talking about in this book, including the, the sex stuff because of the adultification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me, I would say middle school. Now, of course, you're not just going to hand the book to an 11 year old and say, mm -hmm. go for it. But that's where the reader experience kit mm -hmm. comes in, is that we are doing this in a controlled way, because a lot of the issues that we have are because people are just saying, go for it. That's that dismissal piece where I figured it out and you can too. And it's like, but sis, you're not okay. Why, why do you want to mm -hmm. keep forcing not okay on everyone? And I, and I would agree with Carolyn. I actually, in my mind, um, one of the things that I've been doing, as um, Tamara knows, is I've been on this campaign to collect 50 copies of the book um, from different people to give out 
to black girls and black girl serving organizations in my area. Because one of the things I think for middle school girls um, is that this is definitely one of those, if we have a girls mentoring program, mm -hmm. that this becomes something that they read and discuss as a part of that mentoring program using it with the intergenerational conversation piece that's on the website, because we know sometimes with the, it's this irony in that we view black girls as adults mm -hmm. and we adultify them, but at the same time, we try to keep information from them um, when they need it, because we know in our community, um, black girls are experiencing issues of colorism at 11 and 12, um, even younger than that, but we know that they Earth. are really Right. <laughs> we know that what that little baby ears. <laughs> and we know that they're experiencing that far before 15. We also know that issues of what caregivers look like and friendships look like and gender identity and things of that nature are happening in middle school. And no, but we try, it's the irony of we are keeping all these conversations from you because we don't want to open up that that can of worms, yet you're experiencing it already. And so I think we know that um, the stage of development of self-identity versus role confusion when we're trying to figure out who we are is middle school. And so I think that having this book as a part of a middle school book club mentoring program where we're including that intergenerational discussion to help them navigate some of that is the that sweet early spot where that 15 and older is, yeah, I can begin to process some of this on my own. So I know we're very short in time, um, but again, the only, black the girl. thing that I would add to that is you are right. So my, dr my dream for Dear Black Girl is one, that it gets into black girls' hands and there's a girl that opens this up and reads one of these letters and is like, oh my gosh, that like, that is me. No one has spoken to this experience before, you know, and this, this, this helps me. But what I really want is to is for black girls to get this in their hand with the wraparound programs and the love and the support to process a lot of these things and organizations, especially that will take the time and are bold enough and care about black girls enough to talk about these varied issues and not eliminate some of them because they don't feel like they're palatable. And I know that um people can check the book out at the library, um, which is awesome. Um, but we also know that if a black girl gets this in her hand and she checks it out the library, she's going to want to keep it, which is not acceptable with your local library system. You <laughs> must return the book. So what are um, other ways that people can access, um, get their own copies of Dear Black Girl? Black Girl, Dear Black Girl is available wherever books are sold. So you know, Barnes and Noble, you know, wherever. However, I always tell people to please support local independent bookstores. This has been a really hard year for, it continues to be a hard year for them and they need your support, especially black owned um, local independent bookstores. There are some wonderful ones. I believe there's Brain Lair and Kokomo, there's Source Books in Detroit, there's Mahogany Books in DC. Um, also think about um, Indie Reads books here in Indianapolis, not black owned, but definitely local and independent and important. And before we um, turn it back over to Nichelle, is there anything that you, one message that you wanted to leave um, with people as they look at and need to, again, every black girl deserves a copy of this book. I'm grateful to be doing that campaign here um, and encourage others to do that around the country for black girls in their area. But is there one message that you want to leave with people as they consider reading Dear Black Girl either through their local library or purchasing? I am going to leave by reading the epilogue because I think if there is one thing I want Black girls to feel when they read this book is to feel loved and supported. But first, before I do that, I just wanted you both to share where you can be found um, and your other work, because I know after listening to both of you, people are going to want to get them some Mo, Dr. Tiffany Dent, and Dr. Carolyn Strong. You can find me at Dr. Tiffany on all social media platforms at Dr. Tiffany IG, um, Facebook, Instagram, 
Um, so those are the best ways to connect with me. I am not that put together. So you can find me on Twitter at Black Girl Blues. And you can find me on Facebook at Strong Conversations. And I am going to leave you all with this word, which is pick up your oyster knife. And I hope you recognize the Zora Neale Hurston reference. I love you, Black girl. I love Black girls in Afro puffs and Black girls in bundles of Remy. I love the daddy's girls and the fatherless ones. I love the little sisters who make straight A's and the ones who skip school. I love the hood girls and the suburban girls and the country girls too. I love the quiet girls and the loud girls, the lip smacking, smart talking ones. I love the saved girls and the heathens. I love the girls who stay in sweatshirts and J's and the ones in the tight fashion Nova fits. I love the happy girls and the anxious girls and the girls battling depression. I love the trans girls living defiantly. I love the girls in the library and the ones on the basketball court. I love the virgins and the young mamas. I love the girly girls and the butch girls. I love the girls who fight. I love the girls who love boys and the girls who love girls and the girls who love both or neither. I love you, Black girl, unconditionally. And whether you are 15 or 50, you hear me today. I love you whether you look or act like they say you should. You are not wrong. And when you are wrong, I love you with all your flaws, no matter what choices and mistakes you have made, no matter where you live, no matter what you look like, no matter what thing has happened to you. And the greatest thing that you can learn is to love yourself unconditionally too. It may be the hardest thing you have to learn. And I hope the letters in this book have shown you how. One other thing, black girl, you must learn to love other black women and girls the same way. Love us whether we look or act like they say we should. We are not wrong when we are wrong. Love us with all our flaws no matter what choices and mistakes we have made, no matter where we live, no matter what we look like, no matter what thing has happened to us. Now, this does not mean you have to become a target for another black girl's pain or anger or trauma. It doesn't mean you have to silence yourself in the face of black women. It means you must give your sisters grace and understanding, the benefit of the doubt. So few people give us that. We owe it to each other. We have to acknowledge each other's humanity, even maybe especially when we are walking away. I hope the letters in this book have shown you how to do that too, because we are sisters, black girl. We have to take care of ourselves and each other. You are me, I am you, and we are all right. Inside each of us are tiny pieces of our foremothers, Sarah Boone's ingenuity, Danya Luna's unforgettable beauty, Toni Morrison's incomparable wisdom, Mamie Till's fierce love, Aretha Franklin's creativity, Marsha P. Johnson's fearlessness, Harriet Tubman's will to survive, Katherine Johnson's genius, Michelle Obama's grace. Black girls are made up of all that magic, birthed in the African sun, baptized by the Middle Passage, and burnished by America. That is a power no one else can claim, just us. We are sisters, you are me, I am you, and we will get free together. Zora Neale Hurston, a great black woman writer once said, I do not weep at the world, I am too busy sharpening my oyster knife. An oyster knife is a utensil used to crack open the shell of an oyster to get the tasty meat inside. Zora meant that she wasn't wasting time thinking about the hard parts of being black and a woman. And she didn't care what other people thought about her. She was busy trying to get at all the good stuff that life had to offer. 
celebrate your black girl life. Celebrate us, be like Zora and get that oyster girl. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Thank you, friends. Thank you, library. And thank you for Center for Black Literature and Culture and Nichelle. This is such, you guys, I hope everyone who listens to this understands how lucky we are to have this gem in our community and how lucky we are to have Nichelle um, as the head of it. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. I've learned a lot. And what I'm going to do is to gather my family so we can do a reading via Zoom because we're all over the country. And so we're going to bring in the middle school young ladies in my family and we're going to read it together so they're going to be supported and then also go all the way through to the 20s. And I think it'll be uh, holistic and important for all of us. So this has just been a great time. I've learned so much from all of you. I feel honored to have been in your presence and I thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.